everybody, and welcome to a new series for this particular channel. I know that true crime is fairly big within the ASMR community, and it fits the theme of this channel, so I thought I'd give it a go and see what kind of response there is to it. So today, the first case I will be covering is of the British serial killer, Dennis Nielsen, also known as the Muswell Hill Murderer, who was a serial killer in the late 1970s and early 1980s, until his arrest in 1983. And this case comes from biography.com. Feel free to check out the link in the description. And just before we start, I have to say that I don't know a whole lot about this particular area being serial killers and things of that nature. I know a little bit, but most of this information is going to be new to me, so it is going to be a learning experience. And what I'm trying to say basically is, I'm not an expert, so if you want to see true crime narrated by somebody who has a lot of knowledge about the cases, this isn't going to be the channel for that, but hopefully you guys will still enjoy the cases. So, Let's get started. Dennis Nielsen was born on November the 23rd, 1945, in Fraserburgh, Scotland. His parents' marriage was an unhappy one, and as a result, Nielsen, his mother and siblings, lived with his maternal grandfather, whom Nilsson adored. Nilsson claimed that his beloved grandfather's unexpected death when he was just six years old and the traumatizing viewing of his corpse at the funeral led to his later behavioral psychopathology. His mother went on to remarry and have four children leaving Nilsson a withdrawn and lonely child. Aware of his homosexual attractions, he claimed no sexual encounters as an adolescent, and at 16 he enlisted in the army. He became a cook, serving as a butcher in the army catering corps, learning the skills that served him so well during his five-year killing spree. Oh my goodness, that is fairly shocking. So he trained to be a cook in the army and the skills that he picked up served him well, I'm guessing, to dismember the bodies of the people that he killed. Upon leaving the army, in 1972, he took up police training, where he discovered a fascination with morgue visits. Despite the obvious advantages that police were gave to develop his morbid tastes, he resigned and went on to become a recruitment interviewer. Nielsen's first official brush with the police came in 1973. David Painter, a young man whom Nilsson had met through his work, claimed that Nilsson had taken pictures of him while he was asleep. Painter was so incensed that he required hospitalization as a result of their confrontation. Nilsson was brought in for questioning about the incident, but was subsequently released without charge. 
1975, he took up cohabitation with David Galligent in a garden apartment situated at 195 Melrose Avenue in North London. Although Galligent denied that they had a homosexual relationship, this lasted two years, and when Galligan left, Nilsson's life became a downward spiral into alcohol and loneliness, which culminated in his first murder 18 months later. Nilsson became increasingly disturbed by his sexual encounters, which only seemed to reinforce his loneliness when they were over. He met his first young victim in a pub on December the 29th, 1978, and invited him home, as he had on previous occasions. The next morning, overcome by a desire to prevent the young man from leaving, he strangled him with a tie before drowning him in a bucket of water. Taking the corpse to his bathroom to wash it, he then placed it back in his bed, later remarking that he found the corpse beautiful. He attempted to have sex unsuccessfully, then spent the night sleeping next to the dead man. He finally hid the corpse under his floorboards for seven months before removing it and burning the decaying remains in his back garden. Wow, so he kept the corpse for seven months. I can only imagine how bad the smell would be in his apartment. Nielsen had another close call with the police in October 1979, when a young student accused Nielsen of trying to strangle him during a bondage play session. Despite the student's claims, no charges were pressed against Nielsen. So it looks as though in October of 1979 there was an opportunity there to perhaps catch him having only killed one person at that point, but unfortunately no action was taken. Nielsen encountered his second victim, Canadian tourist Kenneth Ogenden, at a pub on December the 3rd, 1979. Following a day of sightseeing and drinking, which ended at Nielsen's apartment, Nielsen again succumbed to his fears of abandonment and strangled Ockenden to death with an electrical cable. He cleaned up the corpse as he did before and shared the bed with it overnight. He took photos, engaged in sex and finally deposited the corpse under the floorboards, removing it frequently and engaging in conversation as if Ockenden were still alive. So it seems to me that really what was driving his desire to kill was the fear of being alone. So he did this because he just couldn't face a life of being alone so much so that he would rather kill than be alone is, is really quite shocking to me. His third victim, some five months later, was Martin Duffy, a homeless 16-year-old who he invited to spend the night on May the 13th, 1980. As with his first victim, Nielsen strangled, then drowned him, before bringing him back to bed and masturbating over the teenager's corpse. Duffy was kept in a wardrobe for two weeks before joining Ockenton under the floorboards. Okay, so at this point we had 
two different corpses under the floorboards, which is really, to me anyway, it's a very shocking image. This isn't an area I'm used to covering, so yeah, it is pretty shocking to me, and I consider myself somebody who isn't very easily shocked. I watch a lot of horror movies and things of that nature, but the fact that this was real is just making it a little bit more shocking to me. But yeah, it's still very interesting at the same time. His next victim was prostitute Billy Sutherland, 27, who had the misfortune of following Nielsen home one night. He too was strangled. Another one of his victims, 24-year-old Malcolm Barlow, was an orphan with learning disabilities who was soon dispatched by strangulation. By 1981, Nielsen had killed 12 men in the apartment, of whom only four could be identified. Given his penchant for preying on the homeless and the unemployed in a large city, this is probably less surprising and it might be in a smaller community. Nielsen claimed he went into a killing trance and on seven occasions actually freed the man rather than completely act because he was able to snap out of it. The majority of his victims were not so lucky. Okay, so based on this bit of information there were occasions when he was going to kill but he claims that he was able to snap out of this killing trance as he called it which allowed the men to escape by the time Barlow was killed Nielsen was forced to stuff him under the kitchen sink as he was rapidly running out of storage space with half a dozen bodies hidden around the apartment. Oh my goodness. He was forced to spray his rooms twice a day to be rid of the flies that were hatched from the decomposing bodies. When neighbors complained about the smell, he convinced them they stemmed from structural problems with the building. Alright, so at this point, the bodies are starting to pile up in his apartment and the smell is starting to become noticeable by neighbours. It's quite a, a shocking image and I can only imagine just how terrible that smell would have been. To get rid of the corpses, he would remove his clothing and dismember them on the stone kitchen floor with a large kitchen knife, sometimes also boiling the skulls to remove the flesh, also placing organs and viscera in plastic bags for disposal. He buried limbs in the garden and in the shed and stuffed torsos into suitcases until he could burn the remains in a bonfire at the end of his garden. On occasions, he would burn fires all day without raising any suspicion from the neighbors. He generally crushed the bones once the fire had consumed the flesh, and police found thousands of bone fragments in the garden during later forensic examinations. In 1982, in a desperate attempt to stifle his homicidal behaviour, Nielsen moved into a top floor apartment at 23 Cranley Gardens, Muswell Hill, also in North London, which had no garden and no convenient floorboards. Still unable to quell his impulses, a further three victims were killed in his apartment between his arrival and February 1983. These victims were identified as John Oilett, Archibald Graham Allen and Stephen 
Sinclair, and presented Nielsen with much greater disposal challenges, given the apartment's lack of direct access outdoor space. He overcame these obstacles by boiling the heads, feet and hands and dissecting the bodies into small pieces that could be flushed down the toilet and disposed of in plastic bags. There were five other tenants at Cranley Gardens, none of whom knew Nielsen very well, and in early February 1983, one of them called out drain specialist Dino Rod to investigate a drain blockage. In the presence of the tenants, including Nielsen, the technician discovered rotting human remains when he descended via the outdoor manhole, and it was decided that a full inspection would be conducted the next day after which the police would be called in to investigate. Nielsen, increasingly aware of the prospect of capture, tried to cover his tracks by removing the human tissue from the drains that night, but was spotted by the downstairs tenant, who became suspicious of his actions. It was reported that on the morning of February the 9th, 1983, he told a work colleague laughingly, if I'm not in tomorrow, I'll either be ill, dead, or in jail. So essentially, at this point, Nielsen knew that the net was closing in, and there was a very good chance that he was going to be arrested. Nielsen was met on the evening of February the 9th by Detective Chief Inspector Jay, who informed him that they wished to question him in relation to the human remains that had been discovered in the drains. Upon entering the apartment, Jay noticed the pervasive foul odour and asked Nielsen what it was, at which point he calmly confessed that what they were looking for was stored in bags around the apartment, which included two dismembered heads and other larger body parts. Okay, so essentially, at this point he knew the game was up, and he didn't even try to hide it, he just confessed to what they were looking for. Upon his arrest, he immediately provided exhaustive details about his killing spree, admitting to killing 15 young men despite receiving a legal caution. He also admitted to the attempted murder of seven others, although he could name only four of them. At no point did he show any remorse and appeared eager to assist the police with amassing evidence against him, even taking them to his old address to point out specific disposal details. After the confession, Nielsen was held at Brixton Prison pending trial. Whilst there, he wrote over 50 notebooks of his memories to assist the prosecution and also drew what he referred to as sad sketches, which detailed his treatment of some of his victims. He seemed ambivalent about his fate at turns without remorse, and then, showing concern about public attitudes towards him, he fired his legal counsel, then rehired him, and fired him once again, shortly before he came to trial. The trial commenced on October the 24th, 1983. Nielsen was charged with six counts of murder and 
two charges of attempted murder. He pleaded not guilty to all charges, citing diminished responsibility due to mental defect. The prosecution relied primarily on the extensive interview notes that resulted from his arrest, which took over four hours to read verbatim to the jury, as well as the testimony of the three victims, Paul Nobbs, Douglas Stewart, and Carl Stotter, who had managed to escape, and all of whom he had attempted to strangle. Despite attempts by Nilsson's defense to undermine the testimony of these victims by introducing evidence of their sexual encounters with Nielsen, their harrowing accounts inflicted serious damage on the defense case. Physical evidence, including photographs of the murder scenes, as well as the chopping board used to dissect the victims and the cooking pot used to boil the skulls, feet and hands, which is now on display at the Black Museum at Scotland Yard. My goodness, so some of the items that Dennis Nielsen used to dissect bodies and boil up various body parts are actually on display. But yeah, that surprises me that something like that would be put on display as if it was something to be proud of. The defense case relied primarily on the testimony of two psychiatrists, Dr. James McKeith and Dr. Patrick Galway. McKeith described Nielsen's troubled childhood inability to express feelings and the resulting separation of mental function from physical behavior, which affected his own sense of identity and implied an impaired responsibility on the part of Nielsen. Under intense cross-examination by the prosecution, however, McKeith was forced to retract his judgment about diminished responsibility. The second psychiatrist, Galway, diagnosed Nielsen as suffering from a false self syndrome characterized by outbreaks of schizoid disturbances, which made him incapable of premeditation. But most of his testimony was extremely technical, even giving the judge cause to question Galway's complex diagnosis. The prosecution called Dr. Paul Bowden as a reputable psychiatrist who had spent considerable time with Nielsen, finding no evidence for much of the testimony put forth by the defense psychiatrists. He stated that Nielsen was manipulative with some signs of mental abnormality, but nevertheless still responsible for his actions. During the summing up, the judge dispensed with the majority of the psychiatric jargon that had perplexed the jury by instructing them that a mind can be evil without being abnormal. The jury retired on November the 3rd, 1983, but were unable to reach a unanimous verdict. The following day, the judge agreed to accept a majority verdict, and at 4.25 p.m., they delivered a verdict of guilty on all six counts of murder. The judge sentenced Dennis Nielsen to life in prison without eligibility for parole for at least 25 years. Dennis Nielsen died in prison in 2018. So if I was to sum up this case in my own words, I would say that I don't think Dennis Nielsen was the worst of the worst. He didn't kill for pleasure. He did it because he was lonely and he couldn't face being alone. 
so he'd sooner take a life and have control over that person than be by himself. And I also think that it's very interesting to note that he wanted to stop. He even moved to a location that was far from suitable for killing, being an upstairs apartment with no floorboards and obviously no back garden, which made disposing of the bodies a difficult task, but ultimately he couldn't fight his urges to kill. Okay guys, that is just about it for our very first true crime episode. I hope you enjoyed it and let me know if you'd like to see more true crime cases covered on the channel. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to hit the like button, drop a comment and consider subscribing if you haven't done so for plenty more content like this in the near future. This is the first in the series, so if you're watching this video in the future, feel free to check out the playlist for True Crime to see more videos in this area. But a huge thank you for joining me today, and until next time, rest easy, sleep well, and I hope to see you again very soon for another video, and goodbye for now.